Welcome to the Pretty Intense Podcast. Please take a second and hit subscribe. We have a guest who really, really lives up to the name of the Pretty Intense Podcast, and his name is Randall Carlson. He has a podcast called Cosmographia. He is also a geomythologist. He has been studying the planetary evolution of the continents, water, impacts on Earth, and how it's shaped our planet. And what you'll find is not very long. Like, of course, there was the dinosaurs, the cataclysm 65 million years ago in the Yucatan, but then, you know, just in the last 15,000 years, you will be blown away in this episode to understand the, the, the changes that we've experienced on this planet. Randall has been doing his research for over 50 years. He's been interested in this since he was still in high school and has come to some amazing conclusions through research as to what's happened on our planet and what might be coming down the pipeline. And by pipeline, I mean <laughs> from the sky. I hope you enjoy this episode. This will be the first of many, I'm sure. Uh, please enjoy this one. Let me know what you think in the comments of other areas of fascination that might apply to Randall. All great athletes have one thing in common. They take care of their bodies. It's something that we do from a young age, whether we work out, the food that we eat, how we prepare our mind. This is all part of becoming a great athlete. And one thing that I do every single morning is I drink AG1. I do it before I have coffee. I do it before I eat any food. I really feel like for me, it's helped my gut health. It's made my stomach just feel like less bloated and more calm throughout the day. It handles all food so much better. I'm putting like 75 high quality ingredients into my body first thing in the day, which makes a huge difference. Even if I'm traveling, I use the travel packs. I was in Europe for six weeks. Every single day I put AG1 into my body. So if a comprehensive solution is what you need from your supplement routine, then AG1 is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash pretty intense. That's drinkag1.com slash pretty intense. Check it out. Perfect. Well, I think then Atlantis is the place to start then because it seems like did Lumeria become come before Atlantis in ancient history? You know, we have a really good solid source for Atlantis, which is Plato, right? And we can document back when Plato wrote down the account of Atlantis, probably where he got it. Lemuria is a little bit iffier. Um, now, there were land masses in the Pacific that were certainly habitable during the Ice Age with the lowered sea level. Were those Lemuria? I don't know. I, I suspect that there's some historical truth behind Lemuria. Um, but I haven't found the kind of details that Plato gives in his two dialogues that you can use to um, attempt to corroborate whether there could have actually been a landmass situated geographically as Plato described. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the Lemurian stuff has come from like channeled type information, okay. which I don't discount entirely, but I also take it with a pretty generous dose of skepticism because I've heard so much of it, you know, that comes from on high, the ascended masters, whatever you want to call them. And it's uh, uh, a lot of it is contradictory. A lot of it is just kind of self-help type stuff, kind of with a kind of some cosmic terminology thrown in. Um, and, and so a lot of the Lemuria stuff to me doesn't have the solid basis as the Atlantis story mm -hmm. does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and there are references there are they're 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 um they're not um you know overwhelmingly convincing as to the historical reality of atlantis but there are like proclus um who, whose original writings are lost was quoted by Crantor later on and apparently he believed and accepted in the reality of atlantis there was there was basically two schools of thought plato in his dialogues, makes very clear oh, repeatedly that what he's telling and recounting is a true tale, that it wasn't made up, that that it really did exist. The Aristotelians came in and said, basically, they didn't believe that Atlantis actually existed and, um, and that he meant it as an allegory for his idea of the, the idealized poli political state. And so we've had those kind of two opposing viewpoints ever since then. 
uh, mm -hmm. ever since, you know, the classical Greek times. Um, Plato was what was he roughly three forty three fifty BC in the Socratic Forum, where the the story of Atlantis was supposedly told. So as you come down through history, you have these two opposing schools of thought. One is that it was an allegory and the other that it actually existed. So what I did, oh gosh, this had to have been 20, 25 years ago. I had read several books on Atlantis um, that kind of inspired me to look further. Uh, there was two books that came out in the late 79 or 1980. Um, one by a German physicist named Otto Mook, who proposed that that Atlantis was a real place and that it met its demise because of a an asteroid impact. Interestingly, mm -hmm. and this was proposed uh, in 1980, the same year that the Alvarez team and two other teams independently proposed that, that the KT boundary, where the dinosaurs died off, was the result of an impact. They found the iridium layer uh, first in Italy, then I think Denmark, then in New Zealand, and then all around the world. Iridium mm -hmm. is abundant in meteorites and asteroids. It's very uh, scarce on the surface of the earth. Hmm. It's a siderophile, which means it bonds with iron. So in the formation of the earth, all the iridium bonded with the iron, sank towards the core, and therefore left the surface of the earth deficient. However, it's very abundant in, like I said, meteorites and asteroids. So finding a, an abundant layer of iridium right at that key boundary where the dinosaurs disappeared was a huge clue. So you had, on the one hand, you had the hardcore scientific community proposing an idea that was very controversial at the time, but eventually within a decade gained acceptance. Now, at that same time, Mook and several others in the late 70s and early 80s were proposing that asteroid and comet impacts had played a much larger role in Earth history than had been previously admitted or recognized, see? So I read that book, and I thought that was very intriguing that he was saying that. And then there was another book, Sir Sir Cedric Leonard was his name. Um, oh, I don't remember the exact name of it. But he, he proposed that there had been evidence of a cataclysm around the time that Plato placed the, uh, the subsidence of Atlantis. And one of the things that he did was he talked about the great Pacific Northwest floods, which at that time, you know, going back, if you know some of the background stories, you know, in the 1920s and 1930s, they, he's, he was a, a high school geology uh, teacher initially when he started his research. And then he ended up at the end of his career winning the Penrose Medal, which is the highest honor that geolog the geological community bestows on its members. So um, he was eventually vindicated, but only after this long period of controversy where he was, uh, you know, defamed and discredited and, and so on. Anyways, he proposed in the 1920s and 1930s that there had been these tremendously giant, first a single flood, then it got more complex and it added to the floods out in the Pacific Northwest. And, um, and so anyways, in Cedric Leonard's book, he talks about, he's talking about evidence for from around the world, very much like Emmanuel Velikovsky did earlier, which was collecting together evidence, geological evidence, that there had been catastrophes in recent Earth history. Um, so he had talked about that particular flooding. And as it turned out, uh, the year after I got out of high school in the early 70s, I spent the whole summer traveling around all of the Western states and inadvertently getting obsessively interested in geology. Like I'm looking at these features and going, there was always something that struck me about the, the, the textbook explanations that everything happened very slowly over millions of years, one grain of sand, one drop of water at a time. Right. So I had this first impression in actually the summer of 1970, driving through the Columbia Gorge with a buddy of mine and looking at these features and just, these compelling features, um, some of the tributary rivers to the Columbia had these gigantic fan deltas spread out from their mouth. Mm -hmm. And they were so huge that, that it almost, I got, remember getting this impression that I was almost like, uh, you know, in the, in, uh, out of Gulliver's travels or something. And I was in the land of giants. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. That's another topic we could get into. Yeah. So then I, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, and then driving back across, uh, to my home state where I lived at back then in Minnesota, 
we drove across the scab lands. And at the time they didn't impress me too much because I didn't really understand and didn't see really what was, you know, we kind of skirted it. Um, I didn't see some of these spectacular features. So I read Le Leonard's book and he talked about that. And I'm like, I remember that. Yeah. I remember driving, you know, up the Columbia Gorge and thinking how incredible the scale of things was. So at that point, I really got interested and I went, started spending, well, I'd already been spending time in, in libraries. They have collections of the old geological journals. I started going through Harlan Bretz's early work. And hmm. I would go in and I would get pull out the journal, whether it was a Geological Society of America journal, whatever it might be. I would pull it off. I would read the paper. I would photocopy it. And then I would read it, reread it. And so I followed all of his work. His first paper on the flooding was 1923. And his last paper was 1969. And so I followed, you know, meticulously through each of his papers. Then I read not only his papers, but the critics. And Good why, idea. yeah, I try to look at both sides Yeah, you know, fair. with the younger Dryas, same thing. I've read all of the papers, both pro and con for the younger Dryas impact hypothesis. Mm -hmm. You don't know. I mean, because there were, there were legitimate criticisms to what Brett's was saying, just like there are legitimate criticisms to the younger Dryas impact hypothesis. But so what I did was, and then. Of course, this is, you might know this by now, Danica, when you start doing research, you kind of open up multiple rabbit holes. I got very interested in paleohydrology, which is the study of ancient water movement um, as a result of reading Brett's. But at the same time, you know, I got interested in planetary geology because of the whole impact phenomena. And, and I was like trying to integrate the ideas of Mook and, and Leonard in that Mook was saying that a, a six mile asteroid struck the earth at 11,600 years ago, which I don't believe is the scenario anymore. Interestingly, though, at the same time he's proposing that, the Alvarez team is proposing in the scientific literature that a six-mile asteroid struck the Earth 65 million years ago and killed off the dinosaurs, right? As I learned more about the energies and the power of impacts and things, I thought if a six-mile asteroid had struck the Earth 11,600 years ago, we wouldn't have recovered yet. You know, I grew up in rural Minnesota. So in rural Minnesota, where we lived just northwest of the Twin Cities was okay. right at the edge of what is called the superior lobe of the Laurentide Ice Sheet, which, you know, that Canada was c covered in a massive, mm -hmm. a massive ice that was probably more massive than when you include both the Laurentide Ice Sheet and the Cordilleran together was more massive than the ice sheet that now covers the South Pole. So it was a huge amount of ice from the Atlantic mm -hmm. to the Pacific, from northern United States up to the Arctic Circle. And it was up to perhaps a mile and a half thick. Now, that was still existing 14, 15, 16,000 years ago. Oh, my God. The time to get rid of that ice was, a pre, was a, before dating, like radiocarbon dating and so on. It was imagined that the that, that period of to, necessary to get rid of that much ice was 50,000 years or 100,000 years. See, we've, we've recently, in the mid-19th century, this planet Earth came out of what is called the Little Ice Age. You may have heard of that term. Mm -hmm. Little Ice Age. It was, it was the coldest multi-century period throughout the entire Holocene, which is the huh. last 11,600 years since huh. the Great Ice Age ended. And we can tell from study of glacial moraines that that it the the glaciers worldwide swelled to the biggest they had been in over ten thousand years, right? So now, what happened with the birth of glaciology? Early, uh, the early scientists, natural philosophers, they were called back then, who were looking and seeing. You know, it was well known that the glaciers had had grown enormously, say between. 1400 and and 17 or 1800 um hmm. overwhelmed whole villages were wiped out farms were obliterated by the the hugely growing glaciers wow and so it became apparent that uh to these early observers they would watch the the glaciers then receding which they began doing and i point this out to people when they we talk about glacier recession is that the glaciers worldwide had grown to their largest extent in, in 11,000 years, roughly. And when we start measuring glacier recession, we're measuring 
a, a process that started 150 years ago or 175 years ago mm -hmm. and started with our baseline, the glaciers being bigger than they have been, like I said. Ever. So it's not a fair, it's not a fair metric. No, it's not. It's 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 an uh, a very misleading metric. Exactly. Totally. So, anyways, by watching the rate of recession or or decrease in size of the glaciers, these early researchers extrapolated to the big glaciers, and they thought, okay, based on what we've seen with the with these glaciers melting back into rates, they then extrapolated backwards and thought, well, if you're got to get rid of you know, 6 million cubic miles of ice, which is an enormous amount of ice covering north half of North America, it's going to take a long time because for one mm -hmm. thing, it's not going to be a, a linear continuum. It, you're going to have, assuming, and catastrophes weren't really part of the equation so much then, but the idea is that you're only going to get seasonal melting. And sure. then you're going to get in the summer, the glaciers will shrink, winter will come, they'll actually enlarge again. Right. Right. So given that, it was assumed that, you know, you had a process that might have taken 50,000 years or even longer. Well, now radiocarbon dating is invented in the 1950s. And by the early 1970s, there's 20 years of data now in hand. So what this data is showing is that everything went an order of magnitude quicker than anybody had imagined. In other words, you go back 35,000 years ago in Canada, where it was assumed was completely frozen, locked into the ice sheet, there were forests growing. Well, then clearly, if there were forests growing right where the, the glaciers were supposed to be at their thickest, right up, say, around Hudson Bay, there were no glaciers there, right? So, see, this, this created a problem. And so in 1973, there was a, a conference held. Um, by a bunch of geologists and glaciologists and 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 people kind of associated with studying uh, the, the the global change. Mm -hmm. And they what they did was they tried to figure out, okay, so if if instead of fifty thousand or a hundred thousand years to get rid of this huge mass of ice, and we're talking about six million plus cubic miles of ice, if if Okay, it didn't take 50,000 years. How long did it take? Well, they came up with the number of roughly 10,000 years. And so this this created a problem. Is Here's this based off of the melting over the short amount of time? They're thinking that that ratio is consistent, even though it's not? Yes. Yes. So so what they then, well, what that led them to do was to to realize that in order to get rid of that ice, to convert ice to water, which is what happened. It had to get convert can get get converted to water, and then that mm -hmm. as it melted, it drained off. And you know, ocean levels, as you may know, were over four hundred feet lower during the peak of the ice age. Now that in itself is a very interesting topic to dive into, and what the implications of that are. If you drop sea level by four hundred feet, what do you think happens to the coastlines of the world? Mm -hmm. They're not. They're not anywhere near where they are now, are they? Well, I think coastlines all over the planet and various different points in times in history don't always seem consistent. Even in my trip to Egypt, looking at the temples and pyramids, they they were all met by the river, the Nile. Now they're nowhere close. The, the Nile is nowhere yeah. close. And, you know, there are old maps of Antarctica yes. being yes. completely vegetative and there is green and plants and whether that's true or not, obviously, coastlines and and climate have evolved and changed Absolutely. through the course of this planet's history to a complete degree. Like not a very complete, like hot to cold, cold to hot. Yes, yes. Water to dry. <laughs> yes. The the planet we live on has is way more dynamic than anybody was even imagining a generation right. ago. And when you get, and I'm I'm going to come back to the to these conferences in the early '70s, but I'll digress for a minute, and I'll say that in the in the global warming scenarios, they basically are coming out of the 1980s, before we had like satellite surveys of shifting sea levels, uh, before we were uh, recording variable output of the sun, for example, there were no mm. solar 
satellites looking huh. at the sun in 1988 when global <laughs> warming was first proposed. So right. it became very easy to dismiss or ignore the role of the sun in the computer models, right? Well, we know a whole lot more about the sun now than we did back then, right? So the, what, what every single front of scientific research into Earth history confirms that the history of this planet is extraordinarily dynamic and is subject to all kinds of changes, which brings mm -hmm. us back to these early conferences in 1973, where they got together and they looked at the rate at which the ice sheet melted. And they said, okay, you have to have energy from somewhere yep. to convert the ice to water. And so they struggled mightily to come up with a source and they couldn't do it. So at the end of that conference, they, they referred to it as the energy paradox. And they said, we'll put it on the shelf. So two, uh, two years later, in 1975, a follow-up conference was held. They took another look at the data. The only thing that had changed in those two years was even the time span had even compressed further. And even there, if you're thinking eight or 10,000 years to get rid of the ice, you're still thinking of a smooth linear continuum, not a, a thing that we know now with the Younger Dryas, for example, at 1300 years, the melting process was not only stopped, it was probably reversed. Mm -hmm. And so you had this mm -hmm. period of mm -hmm. rapid melting followed mm -hmm. by this rapid shift back into major glacial cold, mm -hmm. and then you had this regrowth of the ice sheet. So, mm -hmm. um, so what has happened is it, it, we're confronted with this paradox that nobody came up with the idea of where did the energy come from. This was the, the nobody came up with yeah. the answer. Um, and and they said there must be an error in the data somewhere. Um. But when you read these papers from the early 70s, you can just see that they're scratching their heads trying to figure out how do we explain such a rapid disappearance of glacial ice compared to what we like calling, you know, things that we don't understand in the universe, dark energy and dark matter. We just give it a cool name and call it a give paradox it a, and go. Give it a name. Yeah, there it <laughs> Junk is. Junk DNA. <laughs> yeah. But see, now, since what happened was. In, in my own research, I came to the conclusion that the most likely source of energy was some kind of a cosmic impact. Now, this was back in the, in the early 90s. And I heard about this these features near where I live called the Carolina Bays. And the Carolina Bays are this series of elliptical formations. There's, there's tens of thousands of them um, on the co coastal plain of, of North and South Carolina, Georgia. They're elliptical and and they so they I mean in the at the on the edge of the water it's sort of like a they the start erosion. It's it's like imagine a shallow lake or swamp that's elliptical shaped. Okay. Um, huh. And there were thousands of them, and the the first they were first discovered in 1930s uh, with the first aerial surveys of the southeastern United States during the Roosevelt administration. Oh, wow. That's so and, interesting, even in, of it, in and of itself, the fact that the 1930s is the aerial observation. But, you know, we've had like, you know, images of the planet and the countries and the, I mean, there's so many things that we've had for so much longer. And it's like, mm, where'd those come from? Yeah. Well, see, nobody knew about them because, um, you, from the ground, you don't really see them. It's when you get above and you look down that you can see these features and how amazing they are. And and they are really, um, you know, I just went to, you heard about a couple of months ago, there was the Cosmic Summit mm -hmm, in Asheville. Mm -hmm. Did you hear about that? Okay. Mm -hmm. So there was, um, my friend Chris Cottrell has been studying the Carolina Bays for years so he did a really interesting presentation on their origin, and there's multiple theories as to their origin. I still lean towards a multiple impact event. Uh, you know, you've heard of the Tunguska event of 1908, the 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 explosion over Siberia. No. Oh, Danica, you need to know about this. <laughs> Sounds like this was like okay. This is like the cos the cosmos giving us flicking us going hey. But you better pay attention because there's bigger things happening here. Yeah, this is so in, in 1908, early uh, on the date that coincides to our June 30th, early okay. in the morning, sun is just coming up. It's up near Lake Baikal. Um, a heavenly body brighter than the sun came through the atmosphere and then 
at descending towards the earth at a high rate of speed and at five, roughly five miles above the surface of the ground, it exploded. And the shock wave went out and it devastated over 800 square miles of old growth Taiga forest. It had, the estimates are that it released energies roughly equivalent to a 15 megaton hydrogen bomb. Oh my God. So, okay. Wow. That would create a lot of heat. Yeah, it would. And it did create a lot of heat. So there was over 80 million huge old growth trees that were just snapped off like twigs, splayed outwards from the epicenter under where this thing exploded. And um, it was not even discovered for almost 20 years later before scientists got there because it was so remote. But the villagers, when they they get there, the, the, the Tungusi tribes people that live there had a whole new religion <laughs> spawned by this by this event um and the area over which it exploded was con- was considered to be accursed so when uh leonid yeah. kulik who was the first scientist russian scientist to get to the air because the rumors had been coming out huh. for years that something extraordinary had happened now to give you an idea if you take uh phoenix the area of phoenix or any metropolitan you're in near phoenix right yep okay picture this A 15 megaton hydrogen bomb, 800 square miles, would utterly obliterate the entire metropolitan area of Phoenix. So this is what, this is the scale of this thing, right? Well, so Leonid Kulik got there nearly 20 years later, and he mounted this ridge where he could look out in front of him, and he could see this whole region of devastated forest that was still Mm -hmm. the trees are still splayed out from the from the epicenter under the epicenter itself there are about 200 square miles that were completely incinerated it was just nothing nothing it was just a big vacant land but it was already starting to recover um when he got there but you could still see they you can you can figure out that it was roughly about 200 square miles that was incinerated 800 plus square miles where the the power of the the blast was probably 20 or 30 psi enough that would knock buildings over um and the pressure wave moved out from that epicenter so anyways scientists are still studying the tunguska so it mostly killed right. things though it didn't necessarily like level buildings but it would be enough to um kill anything alive yes and luckily there were no people living there there were people living on the periphery who witnessed mm-hmm. the thing. And those eyewitness accounts are extraordinary, what these people witnessed. I mean, there were people 30 miles away who were like blown 20 and 30 feet, you know, who were sitting on their front porch and the blast wave moved across and they were like literally thrown thrown off their seats or knocked off their, I mean, this is 30 miles from the epicenter. Um, and <clears throat> people described it as being brighter than the sun. Um and the interesting thing to me about it that I I have my own opinion about what it was. There's many different opinions, but there's a there's a meteor stream called the Torrid Meteor Stream that the Earth yep. crosses twice each year. Oh, One we do. Of, we cross that thing twice each year. We cross it twice. One of the oh, peaks. Yeah, there's a there's a um, there's a, a a fall time crossing of the stream, which actually peaks right around Halloween. And I've act, I, I put together a whole discussion about the origin of Halloween that I uh, put up last year. Halloween actually is a very deep ritualized celebration that we do that has that goes back literally thousands of years to the Universal Day of the Dead, and it's been been commemorated the same time of year all over the planet. Interestingly, is commemorated right at the time of the fall time torrid meteor stream. Um, picture an, an elliptical orbit. Right. And this stream is going out to Jupiter, coming back around the sun and making this orbit. Meanwhile, Earth crosses that stream twice in the fall and then again in the summer at the end of June and early July. Now, in the fall, we're crossing the stream when it's coming in. And if you look upstream, you're actually looking out into space towards the constellation of Taurus, hence the the Taurid meteor stream. And almost precisely, you're actually looking at the what's called the radiant point, where where all of these meteors appear to be emanating. 
from that point, it almost is like bullseye on the Pleiades, which is the shoulder of the bull. So now it's a very interesting mythology about the mm. Pleiades, mm. The, 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 the bull of heaven and the yeah, Gilgamesh, for example, fighting the bull of heaven. And, and we won't get into that today, but that's subject matter for another discussion. Very interesting stuff. Anyways, the stream comes in. It goes around the sun in what's called the perihelion passage, which mm -hmm. is when that stream comes as close to the sun as it ever does in its orbit. It then's coming from around behind the sun. And that is where, so when, when the earth crosses that stream um, in the summertime, we're seeing that material, those meteors, they're now coming from behind the sun. So we're looking towards the sun. So in other words, they're very difficult to see, if at all, during the summer, because again, we're looking towards the sun. Hmm. Whereas during the fall, you're looking away from the sun, you're looking right. out towards the constellation. It's getting a reflection or, from the sun now on those, as opposed to being blinded yeah, by the sun. Yeah, you're, you're looking at Yes, that's exact. That's right. So, um, so anyways, <clears throat> the region of space from which the object came, in other words, you know, hundreds of eyewitnesses and they basically, you know, said, well, it, it came from that, that part of space. And they pointed to this region. Some people said it looked like it was being, uh, disgorged from the sun. Others said it looked like it was, uh, you know, being born out of the sun, that kind of thing. So, as a result of that, you know, the astronomers have been able to reconstruct with a pretty good degree of accuracy where that radiant point in space was. In other words, if you were to look in the sky when that thing came in, wh which direction were you looking? Mm -hmm. So now both the direction that the thing came in from and the time of year are consistent with it being a member of the Torrid meteor stream. And so mm -hmm. I, I lean towards that. I think the evidence is strongest that it is a member of that. And it's likely that the Torrid meteor stream is the remnant of a gigantic comet that came into the inner solar system and began this sort of this ping pong game between the sun and Jupiter around between 25 and 30,000 years ago. Uh -huh. Then began to undergo a series of fragmentation events that spawned several cometary nuclei and several meteor streams. And it's been proposed by a number of astronomers now that it was probably uh, an encounter with the Torrid meteor stream was the most likely candidate for triggering the Younger Dryas impact. Would it make a difference coming off of Jupiter being a, maybe a more consistent gravity than coming off of the sun? Would solar flares have some influence on the the media, the the stream staying in uniform sort of trajectory as opposed to having other yes. influences. J J well, Jupiter, of course, is a massive gravitational field which sure. can deflect objects. Oftentimes, when comets are coming in, now the the meteors are the spawn of comets. Comets come in from their reservoirs outside of Neptune, the Kuiper disk, or even outside that, the Oort cloud. And there's a whole interesting discussion how that process happens. But um, Kuiper disk is this, generally it's it's a series of billions of comets that lay into the orbital plane of the, the planets, the, the, the uh, plane of wow. the ecliptic. Conjunctions of the big outer planets can sometimes disrupt these objects, these cometary objects that are in a quasi-stable orbit. What that means is that they're slowly, this whole disk is slowly rotating the sun, right? So each of the individual comets is making this long, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of years to make this long journey around the sun. They're part of the solar system. Conjunctions of the outer planets, Uranus and Neptune, can, when they combine, can disrupt the stability of the cometary orbits on the inner flanks of that Kuiper disk. And if you can picture um, almost a slingshot phenomena, if this comet is moving through space, now here come the two planets with their combined gravitational field. Let's say yeah. they're behind the comet. So what they're doing is is their their gravity field is acting to yeah. slow down, to break, like put the brakes on. Well, when that happens, 
the comet then loses energy and it begins to migrate sunward. The reverse of that is if the comet is behind and you've got the gravitational field of the two outer planets, Uranus and Neptune, they can accelerate the comet. Well, then the, the comet then tends to move to a higher, higher energy level and it moves away from the sun. Mm -hmm. It turns out that the four big outer planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, are exactly precisely spaced according to their masses that would be necessary if you're going to create this handoff, this bucket brigade of handing comets from the their zone mm -hmm. out there in the Kuiper disk to actually sending them sunward. When they come sunward, it's like when you're out there in the Kuiper disk, they're in they're in deep freeze. It's like they're in hibernation. Hmm. As they move sunward, they become active, right? And the then, energy. yeah, exactly. Then they start coming apart, and and what they might make multiple loops around the sun. And each time they come close to the sun or close to Jupiter, the the strong gravity of those two objects will further disrupt the coherence of the cometary nucleus. And eventually what happens is that nucleus disintegrates into a meteor stream. Hmm. And, you know, and it's named after the point in space where it appears that the meteors are emanating from. So the Taurids, like I said, if you, if you go out on um, Halloween and you stand and you, you face Taurus the bull, which happens to be in the Northern hemisphere, due south, right? And you stand here in your face and you find the Pleiades and you focus on the, because the Pleiades culminate right at midnight on Halloween, coincidentally. So if you look at those, that space region in space, that's where you will see the meteors appearing to shoot out from, right? That's the radiant point. Now, Leonids, named after Leo, because if you look at the Leonid shower, you're looking towards the uh very close to the star regulus which is actually the sh like the shoulder of the lion uh the geminids associated with gemini the draconids associated with with draco so that's how they get their names they're not actually coming from draco or leo or taurus they're just in that meteor mm -hmm. they're in that zone where if you're look imagine if you've yeah. ever walked down railroad tracks and you see how they sure, yeah. you, you know they're parallel, but they give the illusion that Converge. they're converging. Yeah. And that's yeah. kind of what, yeah. It's almost like you're looking up a tunnel when you're looking at a meteor shower. How do they ever get the names then in the first place? Like what what drove the names then? And when how old are those names? Of uh, for the constellations? Uh, yeah, the, but the, but even before the constellations sounds like came the meteor stream that is that is in that area well that's or which a good one question. came first which one came first well what came first was the constellations okay the the, the, the zodiacal constellations and if you uh -huh. look at these gemini taurus now draco not is not part of the the zo zodiac belt but leo gemini it's got to uh, be something angry for aries i mean we're really we're really aggressive. So there's got to be some aggressive meteor stream out there. Well, they're the er Eritids are called so-called, and they are probably like an offspring of the Taurids. Wow. Because, you know, Taurus and Aries are next to each other. Yeah. So mm -hmm. when you have this splitting that occurs, what will mm -hmm. happen is each object of the initial object, it breaks up. Now you've got two nuclei, let's say. That further breaks up, but as they're traveling, they will separate. So now what yeah. it appears is the Eritids are a cousin to the Taurids. And probably if you go back, they all stemmed from that original progenitor comet, which would have been a huge cometary nucleus, 50 to 100 miles in diameter. So and is this, is this, um, is there a cycle to, to these impacts? Is there a um, cycle to these cataclysms? And what would the consist? What would a common denominator be in in the in the? I in do the believe. Cycles? Yes, it looks to me like the evidence is pointing quite strongly to there being a periodicity to these events. Which Here's is, how I. This is what I liken it to. Um, imagine, which I'm sure you can do well. You've got a racetrack with a lot of cars going around at a high rate of speed, and you've got a road that cuts right across the middle of it. Right sure. now, initially. 
dangerous. Yeah. So now you've got, let's say you've got a cluster of cars that are, that are clumped together or spread out uniformly. Now that's going to affect, let's say that, you know, you're just, you've got this big elliptical racetrack, the cars are racing around it and you've got a road cutting right across the middle of it. So as you're driving along, you know, uh, like I like to drive in the country because there's very little traffic and I can put some music on and I can kick back and kind of relax, which is totally different from driving in the heavy traffic in Atlanta. But now think of it, think of it this way. This is the analogy I use. So as you're driving along, there's on this country road, there's no traffic. But now the road intersects the racetrack, right? And so now while you're crossing the racetrack and there's no stop signs, there's no red lights or any of that. So you're just going through blindly. Well, obviously what happens is when you're crossing that, the probabilities or possibilities of there being a catastrophic impact increase considerably. Now, further, let's say that all of the cars are clumped pretty much together. So if they're down on one area of the track, maybe Mm -hmm. your probabilities are low. If you're coming through when the clump is right there, now your probabilities are high. Sure. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. But it hit, but we come we come into we we come into orbit with this twice a year. Yes, we do. But we don't have two cataclysms a year. No, 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 we don't because most of the time we come through, we're lucky and we we miss. This sure. would have not been the case thousands of years ago because originally when this comet begins to break apart, the debris of that comet is going to be concentrated in certain areas within its orbit. Now, over thousands of years, that debris will will spread out and become more uniformly distributed throughout the the entire path of the uh, uh, orbital path. Right? Yeah. Early on, if 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 that cometary nucleus is in the early stages of breaking up, there will be periods Fair. where that are much more dangerous than other periods. Mm. If we're crossing, if we're crossing and larger clumps too, larger clumps too. So it hasn't broken up either. So, you know, something that comes through and burns up in the atmosphere and turns into some sort of blast as opposed to an impact is going to be a lot less damage too. Yes. And, and like Tunguska was about 150 feet in diameter. That's the estimates roughly about the same size. Have you ever been over to meteor crater by Winslow? Mm. Well, it's right there in your neck of the woods, Danica. This is one of your assignments now, is to go to Meteor Crater. Okay. Um, you, of course, heard the oh, yeah. Eagle song, Standing on the Corner in Winslow, Arizona. Yeah. Okay, such well, it's just a, it's, <laughs> well, such a sight to see is Meteor Crater, which is just ah. a few miles from Winslow. Ah. And uh, go there, stand on the edge of that, and look down in this massive gaping hole in the ground, uh, you know, 3,500 feet across, 600 feet deep. And then imagine that what you're looking at is an impact of a, just a, a cosmic speck, a baby. Interestingly, Meteor Crater was an iron object, which is high density, you know, maybe five grams per cubic cent. Imagine you're holding a piece of cast iron. The Tunguska event was much lower. It was probably a piece of a comet nucleus, like I said, which is going to be lower density, which is going to be maybe a gram, two grams per cubic cent. Imagine an ice cube. Okay, so that's the difference. Cast iron and an ice cube. And a full, a continuum of stuff in between from one end of that continuum to the other, right? The meteor crater in Arizona was an iron object that was able to fully penetrate the atmosphere and strike the ground. Whereas the Tunguska object was lower density Mm It, it almost like a, a belly flop into a swimming swimming pool. The fluid of the atmosphere could not move out of the way in time, and it just essentially compressed in front of it. And once it reached about five miles above the surface, it mm-hmm. it it just exploded. Mm-hmm. So a lower density object is going to explode in the atmosphere up to a certain size, and then once you get big enough, everything's going to hit the Earth directly. Meteor crater was produced by an object roughly the same size, but an iron object struck the earth. Such an event happened today. You would prop Phoenix would, I believe be destroyed. 
by the 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 impact blast moving out from the epicenter. But you what should. What is get the out likelihood there. of this happening again in the near future? Well, let's put it this way: two weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, let's see, July fourteenth, an object two and a half times the mass of Tunguska <clears throat> came less than a quarter of the distance to the moon. Now that's a very, very close shave. Now that would not be a planetary catastrophe. But if you figure this, if Tunguska had, and I did the calculations on this, if Tunguska had the uh, energy of a 15 megaton hydrogen bomb and other, th other things being equal, and this was a, uh, uh, a, um, two and a half times the mass. And it was probably more than that because it was an asteroid. Mm -hmm. So it would have been heavier, right? Mm -hmm. Probably three times to four times the density of Tunguska. If that thing had actually come just a slightly different angle than it did, and it hit the earth, it would have been enough to, I did a calculation. It could have completely wiped out, um, say an area the size of the state of Delaware. Um, it would have been uh, probably around 2,500 square miles devastated. And it was, wow. it was about 45 megatons of 50 megatons of energy, which is about the same as the largest hydrogen bomb ever tested by humans back in 1962 when the Soviet Union tested Tsar Bomba, which mm. was... 50, estimated 50 megatons. Would there be a ripple effect from even that, that the entire planet would know about? Or could this stuff be happening that doesn't really pop up on our radar because nobody's there? Well, <clears throat> think of if you go back to uh, February of what was it, 2013, Chelyabinsk, you had an object much smaller than Tunguska that exploded over that village of Chelyabinsk. And um, 15, rough 1,500 people were injured quite grievously in some cases. Mm -hmm. To my knowledge, nobody was killed, but several thousand buildings were, you know, glass windows were blown in, mm -hmm. um, you know, trees were toppled and things like that. So, and this was just a very small piece. And it, and it exploded like, I think like 12 or 14 miles up in the atmosphere. So the thing is, that there are, you know, the Department of Defense has been tracking these things for decades. I bet. And if you had a Tunguska event, let's say, coming in over the ocean and exploding, we probably wouldn't know it. Mm -hmm. Other than, you know, if you've ever heard of some of the super waves, I've sometimes thought that these anomalous large waves that have been documented might be the result of that kind of an event. Um but yeah, we would certainly know it if if these days if a <clears throat> if a Tunguska event happened anywhere on the planet, we would know it. And of course, mm -hmm. we're much densely more densely populated now. If if a Tunguska event happened now, let's say over the eastern seaboard, you would have at least a couple of million casualties, hmm. um, at least. Um, and if this event uh, from Ju uh, from July fourteenth that just happened, if that thing had had hit the earth. Yeah, it would have been a major game changer. Um, so I don't think anything like that has happened. There is evidence that in the 1930s, there was a multiple impact event in Brazil that was close to the scale of Tunguska, maybe not quite as damaging or destructive or as powerful. Um, but again, because it was remote, um, the, 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 the accounts of it are, you know, pretty sparse. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and and then the area that was destroyed in the rainforest is so quickly recovered that it became difficult sure. to make studies after the fact. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I think that that we can look at you know there's there's a number of proxies we can use to reconstruct ancient climate change and and things like that. Um, ice cores, uh, uh, sea bottom sediment cores. Um, you know, pollen and seeds and plants that accumulate, let's say, in lakes and ponds. I mean, there's all right. kinds of ways that we can reconstruct, you know, tree rings, a great way of reconstructing ancient climate change. Mm. The data in hand to me looks very much like it's going towards some kind of cycles that this does. And, and see, and here's the thing that might be confusing, going back to the analogy of the road going across the racetrack. 
what would be consistent is that every time you're going across that, the vulnerability increases by maybe an order, several orders of magnitude. And the periodicity would be consistent that you could say, okay, just like, um, you know, you, if, if you say when, you know, growing up in Minnesota, we always like, when is going to be the first freeze of the year? Um, when is, when is the first thaw going to be, you know, and usually it's within a one, one or two weeks of the, the, the usual date. Okay. But what I'm getting at here is that in this case, um, even though you, you, you can say with a high degree of, of precise timing, when the periods of vulnerability occur, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's going to be a cataclysm. You see what I'm saying? It all depends on the luck of the draw when you're crossing that highway, whether mm -hmm. there's other cars coming. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you're if, if you picture you've got the, the racetrack and then you've got a big circle and you're driving around that circle, and every time you come around that circle, you're, you're crossing the track, your vulnerability goes up, but it doesn't necessarily mean 100% of the time that you're going to get hit. Right, right. We might think of it as being so vulnerable, you know, twice a year or something like you think, oh, we're coming into yes. contact with it, but it might be just sort of like a, you know, like a flip of a coin. There's a there's a certain ratio for heads yes. to tails. And so it's it's kind of like we're looking at it through the lens of danger every time, but maybe based on the size and the gravity and the elements that maybe some of them we don't really understand is that there's actually the risk is far smaller, essentially, and it might only happen every 12,000 years or 26,000 years or whatever it may be. Well, and interestingly, there does seem to be um, a cycle, a period that looks like it's around both of those, 12 and 26,000. And of course, the Younger Dryas is now dated about 12,000. Younger Dryas impact is mm -hmm. dated about 12,850 years ago, mm -hmm. which is almost exactly half of Earth's processional cycle. There's a book that came out in So fractal. Everything is so fractal. Yes. And it, very much, very much. We live in a fractal universe, and it's fractal not only, I believe, in terms of space, but in time as well. And this is a very interesting discussion we should have at some point, Danica, about mm -hmm. some of the some of these traditions that have come down to us. Um, what I'm very interested in is this convergence of ancient knowledge and ancient wisdom and understanding of how nature worked and our place in it and the modern concepts. And to me, the realization is that they're very complementary and, in fact, are converging on each other. And we're realizing that the legacy of ancient stories and myths and folklore and legends and all of this stuff is, is a very potent source of real information. Mm -hmm. and circling back to the Tunguska thing, I mentioned that there was a, it spawned a new religion. Okay. Well, when you go and you begin to read some of the ancient stories, like when, when Plato, we started this conversation with Atlantis, when Plato opens Timaeus, his first of the two dialogues on Atlantis, what is the very first thing that he dives into is the myth of Phaeton. And Phaeton was the story of the son of Helios, who mm -hmm. grew up not knowing who his father was. And when he would go to school, all of his classmates would always be bragging about all the great things that their fathers were doing and this and that. And poor Phaeton, he didn't know who his father was. Phaeton goes to his mother, begs her to, to tell him, who's my father? And she says, well, your father actually is the, the grandest of all of them. It's he's Helios, the sun God. And so Phaeton makes it his life's mission to seek out his father which he does, and he gets to the great palace where the sun god resides. And there are, there are gates, there are these huge gates. And he goes, and, and if you read Greek mythology, the, 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 the gods and goddesses of mythology have all of these powers and things that they can do, you know, that, that differentiate them from us mere mortals. But one of the things that they're bound by is if they make a promise they are compelled to keep the promise. So Phaeton, Helios is so overjoyed to see his son that he says, I will grant you any boon that you wish. And Phaeton says, 
well, I want to drive your chariot. I want to drive the chariot of the sun. So Phaeton, I mean, so Helios goes, well, uh, wait a minute. I meant anything except that. So then as the, as the myth unfolds, Helios does everything he can to persuade Phaeton not to drive, to drive the chariot of the sun. Okay. Finally, he has to relinquish. Phaeton gets in the chariot and there's four great steeds that are pulling the chariot. The gates open, the chariot flies out, and immediately these powerful steeds, steeds realize that whoever is holding the reins is not up to the task. And they their normal course, which it describes in the myth, would be the, the, the plane of the ecliptic with the signs of the zodiac. The chariot veers off of the normal path of the sun, descends down to earth, and sets the earth on fire. Mm-hmm. Now, first thing that Plato says is he opens his story of Atlantis by recounting the myth of Phaeton. And mm. he says, this has the appearance mm. of a myth, but it's not a myth. He says mm. it right out. Unambiguously says what it really represents is the bodies circling in heaven and the decline of one of those bodies down to the earth. So he's clearly describing a meteor or an asteroid. Right, right. And later commentators agreed that yes, Phaeton must have been a memory of some kind of a cosmic encounter. Okay. It's interesting to me that he prefaces his whole account of Atlantis with that myth. How would Plato know? That's my question then is how would Plato know? And, you know, I feel like I've heard that there that Atlantis was knocked out, but there were survivors and those survivors were the ones that started Comet and started Egypt. They were the original, original, original indigenous people of Egypt. Yeah. So I people were always asking me about Atlantis. So I decided, well, okay, I'm going to put out my thoughts on Atlantis. It turned into a 10 and a half hour lecture, <laughs> something like that, over th over several parts. Um, I live streamed it out a couple of years ago. Um, and what I did is I've gone through Plato's account, four different, five different translations, including the original Greek, wow. in order to correlate, you know, the words that he were translated as island. Did they really mean island? Right, um, right, right. So on. So I've got, in fact, right sitting here next to me, I've got my Greek dictionary. Um, oh my God. Go so I, I procured a the original Greek translation of Timaeus and Critias and went through them line by line, read four, like I said, four or five different translations so I could get the different nuances and stuff from the, how different translators. So, and this, this was like when I first did this, going back to the stories that I said early 80s when I read those couple of books on Atlantis, which which led me ultimately to the ultimate source of Atlantis, which is Plato. So what I did was Plato gives some very explicit details in terms of the geography, the geology, the astronomy, the oceanography, all of that stuff. So what I did was I thought to myself, okay, I'm going to do just a, a thought experiment here. And I'm going to, I'm going to imagine that Somehow, whatever Plato, you know, and he says in there repeatedly throughout the dialogues, this is real. This is true. I'm not making this up. Right. So he gives the, 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 the lineage ultimately from Solon's journey to Egypt, which occurred roughly around 600 BC, a couple of hundred years before Plato. And <clears throat> he gives the succession between, um, Solon and, Dropidus and these in his offspring and how it eventually got down to Critias, and then Critias presented it at the Socratic Forum, where Plato heard it and wrote it down. Okay, so, <clears throat> but the interesting thing that caught my attention early on, and because I had already now become familiar with catastrophism, I did not yet know about the Younger Dryas. This is in the eighties, right? Mm. Um, I didn't know about the Younger Dryas until the nineties. Um, Younger Dryas was identified long before an impact event was proposed as its trigger because they saw in Europe that there was these extraordinary climate changes that occurred at this particular mm -hmm. horizon. So, so, but one of the things that Plato three times, he gives the, the sort of the chronology and he says that 
when Solon went to Egypt, the elderly priests that he talked to told him about this ancient history that had happened 9,000 years earlier. And so they talked about this great war between this Atlantean empire that was a group of islands, plural, in the mid-Atlantic, west of the Pillars of Hercules. And they were originally very uh, highly evolved and very spiritual, but then they degenerated and they became imperialistic and they came in and invaded the nations inside the Pillars of Hercules, which is the Straits of Gibraltar, which is the mouth that separates the Mediterranean from the Atlantic Ocean. So they came in and they began subjugating and enslaving. And then the what I call the the, the proto-Athenians, the, the people that occupied the Greek peninsula, according to this account now, they rallied and organized everybody. And there was this great war between the 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 this groups, the cultural groups inside the Mediterranean against the Atlanteans that had come from outside. And immediately after this war, there was a great catastrophe. Tremendous rainfall fell over Greece, and there was a massive, he talks about this in, in the dialogue, a, a massive, severe erosional event over Greece that wiped out their army. And likewise, there was a series of earthquakes that caused the Atlantic island, islands to subside. And this all, according to the story in the Egyptian priest, happened 9,000 years Huh. before Solon. Solon was 2,600 years ago, so do the yes, math. 12,000 some years. -ish, well, yeah. 11,600, which okay. is precisely the end of the Younger Dryas. Precisely a major climate shift happened, a catastrophic climate change, and also precisely the date of what is called meltwater pulse 1B, when there was a massive melting of the great ice sheets and a huge influx of water and a rapid rise of sea level. Bye-bye, Atlantis. This, yeah, all of this happening precisely on the date that Plato gives. If you look up the Holocene right now and look it up, you'll see that it's usually dated at 11,600 or 11,700 years ago. Uh -huh. And there's this major point of transition the end of the 1,300-year spell of the Younger Dryas, I think that there was probably a secondary impact at the end, or it was maybe the sun. I think we're looking at the, at the end of the last ice age. I think we're looking at a perfect storm. Hmm. One of the things, a question you asked earlier that I didn't address because we kind of, in our long-ranging discussion here, there's evidence that the infall of comets into the sun it might be connected with solar storms and coronal mass ejection. Okay. So it could be that if there was a major influx of cometary mass, this gigantic comet is coming in, breaking up, spawning, you know, these families of, of, of uh, offspring. Mm -hmm. And some of these are most of the cometary material that comes in does end up being swallowed up by the sun. Mm -hmm. And it could be some of the evidence seems to show a correlation between the infall. There's actually a whole family of comets called the Kreutz sun grazers. And even a small object falling into the chromosphere of the sun seems to trigger coronal mass ejections and solar storms. Well, it's energy coming in and then energy going out. Yes, that's right. So there could be a connection then that if you have a large comet coming in to the inner solar system breaks up, Large masses of that fall into the sun. The sun responds. And so we might be looking at not only impacts, but um, solar events. Now, there's an interesting controversy and disagreement between Robert Schock and Graham Hancock, right? You know who those two guys are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Robert Schock is solidly on the sign of a solar event. Graham is pretty solid on the side of an impact event. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whereas I'm standing in the middle going, I think it could have been both. We know that the evidence for an impact at 12,850 years ago, at the beginning of the Younger Dryas, is very robust. We have evidence now from half of the, more than half the planet, signature of an impact event. But what happened at the end of the Younger Dryas? That was the cooling, and that would have been the cooling. That was the cooling. And then at the end of the Younger Dryas, there was an extremely rapid warming, extremely rapid. Um, anomalously rapid, 
mysteriously mm-hmm. rapid. And we don't know what happened there. And to my knowledge, we don't have hard evidence of an impact like we do at the beginning of the Younger Dryas. Mm-hmm. So it could have been the sun. I'm totally open to that. Now, I think Graham, I, I think I've heard that Robert may not be as opposed to the impact idea as he once was. Um, mm-hmm. And that Graham may not be quite as opposed to the sun idea, the solar component. As I don't know if he was ever really against it, but he was definitely on the side of an impact event. So Right. Uh, what about the impact in um, Mexico and the Yucatan? What is that date at? Well, that's the, that's the Cretaceous tertiary boundary. That's the dinosaur killer. And there's very interesting stories we could get into about that. And what the Mayans may have known. You know, one number that obviously was so far off was the age of the universe and having sort of doubled essentially from 13 odd billion to 26 odd billion years old. And Mm -hmm. so I'm wondering about just sort of, you know, the science and technology used to date things and and what what uh, what you think about (laughs) such an epic fail essentially and and how you feel about numbers like 65,000 65 million years or 12,000 years does it seem reliable the dating of of geological strata is going to be a little different than the dating of the universe and in geology we have relative dating um and we have absolute dating <clears throat> now relative dating is basically this if you've got uh, a flood which let's say comes in and puts down a layer of deposits or you have a volcanic eruption and you have a layer of ash or lava. And then after a while, ferns, which are the first colonizer plants, like if you go to Mount St. Helens or any catastrophe, ferns tend to be the first colonizer plant that comes back in the, in the wake of a catastrophe that devastates the ecosystem. And then those ferns go through several life cycles and they provide the, the, the basic matrix for, higher succession plants to to take root and okay. generally it'll take about a millennia for to get let's say from a from a barren landscape like you would have out in the aftermath of the mount saint helens eruption to when you've got mature forests growing there mm-hmm. right but now when you look at geological evidence for example we know that carbonate rocks like limestones dolomites they form in oceans they show, form in shallow seas right um, we know sandstones can form either uh, from the sand of beaches or the sand of deserts. How do we tell the difference? Well, because beaches will have a different morphology than deserts. Deserts, if you look at a sandstone outcrop, and if we ever do a field trip, and you're on one of my field trips, I will show you outcrops of sandstone where you can, and you will quickly learn to differentiate between sands that were deposited by water and sands that were deposited by wind. So by looking at the strata of sandstone, now typically imagine this, Danica, you've got, we talked about ocean levels rising and falling. So imagine that we've got ocean levels where they are now, and we go into another ice age. Now, all of that water is being extracted from the ocean, deposited on the landmass in the form of ice, where uh-huh. it's locked up, that causes sea levels to decline, right. which causes the coastlines to migrate seaward. Well, as as sea level is falling, you've got this shallow marine. Imagine that most of the coastal shelves of the planet off the flanks of the continent are less than 400 feet in depth. So that means large sure, swaths of yeah, the continental yeah. shelves are now exposed. All the coral reefs, everything, are they're going to die, right? Um, yeah. Now, as the, the land, as the ocean is receding, the beach is moving seaward. So you can actually track that, right? Mm-hmm. And then as the, the beach is moving seaward, like where I live here in Georgia, if I go stand on the coastline now and I'm standing there at the beach, right? And all of a sudden I'm transported back 15,000 years ago to the late glacial maximum. I ain't on the beach anymore. I'm 50 miles inland and I'm standing in the middle of a forest. Oh my right? God, that's so crazy. It's just not that long ago. No, it's not. It's not at all. Because for one thing, it's in the well within the time that we humans have been on the planet, right? right? So our ancestors lived through these changes. But here's what I'm getting at. So the sea level goes down. <clears throat> now you've got forests growing 
and and we find the evidence yeah. of forests drowned. Oh right? yeah, sure. Two hundred feet, in, you know, from where you exactly. were, exactly twenty five miles into the ocean. Right. So now sea level rises, and what happens is those areas get drowned, and now you have all the little creatures that make their shells out of calcium carbonate right? And they die and they filter to the bottom and they form layers of limestone. Mm -hmm. Now we know we can track the rate at which those, that bedding forms on the sea bottom, right? Mm -hmm. Now you find a layer of limestone that's a uh, thousand, two thousand feet thick. You know, that is a long, long period of time of deposition. And then it gives way to, let's say shales, well, shales form generally out of muddy water. Mm. Shales, so so as the sea level is going down mm. and you've got the swampy coastal areas yeah. migrating along with it, now what will happen is the limestones will have shales over them. You'll have limestones, then you'll have sandstones that were formed by the beach, and mm. then you'll have shales over that. Then you may have, who knows, like in the Columbia Basalt Plateau where these great floods happen, there are dozens of layers of flooding that occurred over a period of uh, roughly 10 million years, but sandwiched in between some of these lava flows are the remains of whole forests, right? So you know from these kinds of things that there had to be a long span of time. And if you've got a layer of limestone, sandstone, shale, maybe some other stuff, maybe maybe some volcanic deposits, and then another layer of limestone, another layer of shale. Yeah. And you've got this thousands really able to date and thousands things quite of, well. Right. Now we've got radiometric dating, which is being improved all the time. And here's the thing. The radiometric dating is more or less correlated with the relative dating. So in other words, we can assume, okay, if here's the rates of deposition in a shallow marine environment for limestones. And if the limestones are this thick, Okay, it, how long did it take? So now you can get an approximate idea of the passage of time. Now you come in with the various types of radiometric dating, and there's half a dozen different ways of dating the half-lives of, you know, of uranium, of thorium, of these kinds of things. And those more or less correlate and complement mm -hmm. the relative okay. dating, right? Mm -hmm. So... It's like they're at least in the same order of magnitude. So what that does is it kind of builds our confidence that yeah. that, that, that that they're correct. Yep. Yeah, right. yeah. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, let me throw another timeline at you. I know we kind of jumped away from the dinosaurs, um, but I just want to add one more to this sort of orbital loop sort of theme we have going on. And I'm curious about the orbit of Nibiru and the Anunnaki stories and 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 if I think it's what 3600 years or something like that is the sort of orbital loop of Nibiru coming through and that being somehow some kind of uh there's a there's a consistent pattern in a in an in a in an in an evolutionary genetic upgrade with human beings thoughts that was an idea that was actually proposed by mainstream scientists 20 and 30 years ago that there, there was this oh. extra solar planet right now it was Zechariah Sitchin who uh -huh. in the eighties came up with the idea of this 3,600 uh -huh. year cycle. Uh -huh. I, I read a bunch of his work and thought it was very interesting, but I thought at the same time, I'm going to wait and see, I need some hard evidence before I, before I go along with this. Um, I haven't seen it yet. Now, does uh, hard that evidence of the planet having yes. or, of the plant or hard evidence of, um, of well, there is, changes. Uh, well, there's hard evidence of catastrophes, no doubt. And I've done a tremendous amount of work of trying to correlate setting up a timeline of various catastrophes going back several hundred thousand years. Yeah, I mean, that'd be fascinating being a fractal fractal universe and where where there's a rhythm to everything you you know you'd be quite the, quite the prophet there yeah so i don't know about that danica i'm just you know i'm mm -hmm. i'm not going to sign on and i'm not going to reject it there could be something out there i mean there's tantalizing evidence suggesting that there might be something an extra solar type object out there 
I'm more inclined to believe that that there's something that periodically dis like we talked about earlier, something that periodically disrupts the stability of that mm -hmm. zone of comets. Mm -hmm. um, and then it sends this sort of cascading um, phenomena of, of comets moving towards the sun. What seems so crazy is that there's these ancient stories, structures, there's there's so many things that we don't completely understand. Is it more likely that there is extraterrestrial influence or is it that we continue to face these cataclysmic events that create essentially a great reset that reset the the planet from an evolutionary standpoint than it is that we get outside help okay so that is a really interesting question that opens up a huge deep rabbit hole might be beyond the scope of today's conversation <laughs> okay that's okay but, All right, we'll just, we'll just me, touch it <laughs> let me let me let me uh say this you use the term great reset, which I think is a very apropos term, because we'll, apparently you, you, you think about this, Danica, we modern humans, you know, that assume with the same cranial capacity, same bone structure in every way, pretty much identical to modern people, 180,000 years or even 200,000 years old skeletons and remains found that looked like that long ago there were modern humans on the earth. Now, let, let's just take the round number 200,000 years. I mean, how many generations is that? 200,000 wow, yeah. years. That's, yeah. that's an extraordinary number of people that could have potentially lived on earth. And you're and talking shorelines being 50, 50 miles different, 400 feet different ocean you know, uh, sea levels. That's just, you know, we don't get it. We if, don't we do, if we do 25 years as a generation, uh, 200,000 years is 8,000 generations. Okay, so <laughs> think about this. Now we now, and I like to put it this way, the old models of life and the evolution of life were very much just a steady state process that at any given time, it, this is within the Darwinian models, maybe 10% of species are disappearing. At the same time, 10% of new species are appearing. Mm -hmm. And in this model, one species, generally simpler species, evolves into a higher, more complex species. And, and at that point, somewhere, there's no longer viable reproduction between those, those species anymore. And that's okay. when you have a separate sure. species, right? Okay, there. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, here's the thing. The, in the Darwinian model, the transitionary phases should be way more than the two endpoints of this continuum. But what has been, and, and this is the, what the critics have, have, have mounted this argument against the Darwinian evolution, is where are all the, trans, the, the, the transitionary species, right? Well, like where are the skeletons or where is the evidence of those? Yeah, where is the evidence of you know, the transition from, you know, one species to the next. But this was in the pre-catastrophism days. Now it's pretty much accepted that there has been a succession of great catastrophes and the disappearance of species is probably more attributable to catastrophic wholesale destruction of species that did mm -hmm. not leave progeny. And this is pretty well established now. You know, I mean, we've got the Permian Triassic, the late Ordovician, the late Devonian, the 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 Jurassic extinction, the KT, the e, uh, the uh, uh, Eocene Oligocene. We've got the extinction from twelve thousand years ago, where the you know the mammoths and the giant ground sloths yeah. and the saber toothed cats they all disappeared, right? Mm -hmm. So species now appear to disappear primarily during these wholesale episodes of mass mortality right now the other flip side is is the mysterious side what is referred to as after a, a hiatus the rapid speciation all of a sudden boom there's a proliferation of new species where do they come right from? right right and right. and you know just even from a genetic standpoint some you know the dna splicing that can't be explained and Mm -hmm. um, how, you know, we all of a sudden got s stood up where language came from, like these upgrades that came and that we essentially, I feel like it, 
I've heard that we've kind of been about the same for about 200,000 years. Mm -hmm, yeah. And within that, I mean, there's a lot of stuff still unexplained about our own history. And I guess one of the things I was kind of getting to was we have this model now of catastrophic destruction of species. And I think that the primary trigger is extraterrestrial, the great impacts that will cause rapid upheavals in the in the stability of the planetary biosystem, the biosphere, and can also perhaps trigger geomagnetic field events, volcanism, seismology, the onset and termination of glacial ages. I lean towards the idea that ultimately the trigger is extraterrestrial. And I don't mean aliens. I mean extraterrestrial in the sense of comets, asteroids, and their offspring. This is now becoming a much more accepted idea by geologists and paleontologists and so forth, astronomers. You know, we're in this position now where geologists have been going along, looking at the ground under their feet and finding these hiatuses in the geological record where it looks like something really profound happened. And they're usually associated with these mass extinction events. At the same time, astronomers are looking at the heavens. They're finding out and realizing that there's a whole lot more stuff in our cosmic neighborhood than anybody was imagining a few generations ago. I think these two things are coming together, and we're realizing that that there is a cosmic, a, a very important cosmic component to the rise and fall of life on the planet. But mm -hmm. what I now think is that by bringing it home, I think we can say that there's a cosmic influence on the rise and fall of human civilizations. Yeah. And I think it's possible, maybe even probable, that there have been civilizations deep into prehistory that have been completely lost. Now, what archaeologists, the problem that archaeologists have, and this is what I've discovered by reading, particularly like the recent attacks on Ancient Apocalypse, Graham Hancock show, is that archaeologists tend to focus on one strata you know, you might have an archaeologist who, for example, devotes decades to just looking at the evidence of the Civil War, right? That is not going to make them a expert on prehistory, right? But now what archaeologists, and by reading their, um, their interpretations of, of history, what is absent from their understanding, from their models of prehistory is catastrophism. What they have not been cognizant of is the severe extent to which this planet has been subject to these periodic resets, these periodic re global remodeling episodes. When you take that into account, and, and, and before we conclude, I think we should look at a few of those pictures. I'll pull them up just so you can kind of get your head wrapped around the kinds of events we're talking about here. We're talking about events that are on a global scale that more or less erase what was there and it has to start over again. Um, same with civilizations. The other thing, the other thing that they're doing is they're saying, well, we know that there was no advanced civilization because we don't see any evidence of it. Well, first of all, again, you're not taking into account the severity of these global changes. And yes. secondly, when you say advanced civilization, what you're doing is you're holding a mirror up and you're imagining that if there was an advanced civilization deep in the prehistoric past, it must have looked something like our own. I think that's flawed thinking. I think that there are possible technologies out there that a civilization could be built on that don't look anything like our fossil fuel based technologies oh. that we're using today. Yeah. In fact, we should have another discussion about this yeah. uh, because right now, uh, some of the people I've been working with for the last several years, um, this weekend, will be introducing um, a, a demonstration at the Nikola Tesla convention in Albuquerque. I don't know if you got wind of this, but, you know, I was on Joe Rogan's podcast uh, a year ago. No when was it? A year ago, November, I guess. And uh, oh, I've watched some of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's say I was on there with Graham Hancock. And mm -hmm. Graham's before we went on, Graham said, let's not get into talking about technology. He wanted to talk about the catastrophe. Well, somewhere along the line, Joe brought up the subject <laughs> of, of technology. 
Right. And they kind of both looked at me and, and I had, I think Graham knew that I had been talking with some people that had been building prototypes in spring. There was a major assembly of, uh, of some machinery. Um, in July, the, uh, there was, um, an implementation of this machinery on a 400 kilowatt generator. That's part of the London power grid. Mm -hmm. And the managers of the, of the, of the generating plant were convinced enough of the viability of this technology. So this is a power that, source. Yes. And it worked. And, and I am putting together a complete disclosure about all of it. Oh, definitely need to talk but about that. This weekend at the Tesla convention in Albuquerque, New Mexico, the folks, the colleagues, I guess I could call them are going to be there. And they're going to do a live stream demonstration. Obviously, anything in the the, the space of energy, free energy, or um, using the ground like Tesla did. And Tesla's technology could have been dangerous because it would have made Wi-Fi essentially like a conductor and, and be dangerous for electronics. But there is overlaps between this and what Tesla was doing. But this has kind of taken it in a different direction. This is an energy system based on plasma. There's some stuff that I've been sitting on for some time and would be a little premature if we put it out there publicly now. Six months or a year from now, yes, I think we're going to blow the gates off of the ancient history of... Good. There's some other economy. people I've interviewed, too, that have been working hard on this in this space, but funding mm -hmm. is hard. and Funding is hard, yep. Yeah. Getting people to believe them is hard and, you know, getting yeah. patents is hard when you get to go through the rigorous testing of, right. you know, scientific of testing to have papers be, be, be published is it's a, it's an uphill battle with conventional science and those who are trying to uphold that. Yeah. That's the goal is that between now and the end of the year to get all of this stuff out there where it can never be bottled up again, ever. Because so there have cool. been others who have have made inroads into this, and like like you said, I mean there there have been a variety of different things that have happened to suppression of their work and so on. But um, I think this is the this is the one where it's going to go because it's already reached the point where I don't think they'll ever be able to get this genie back in the bottle. It's too late at this point. And what a time to be alive, you know. What I a know. time to be alive. It is. And so the several things have come together, I think. One is that from what I've seen and learned over the last few years, I'm fairly well convinced that what this represents is a rediscovery of something that's been lost. And in our conversation, I'll show you why. I'll build a case by taking looking at some of the some of the stuff from the ancient traditions. You look at these megalithic structures, you look at these, you look at the the location of them and you just think how planetary alignments, the the energy produced, the locations yep. um geolo geologically where they're lined up. I mean all these things, like how did they know? This brings us into the idea that I think that we've really underestimated our own past. Um, we've created this scenario of kind of, you know, the caveman stereotype, totally. you know, and, and I think it's blinded us to what has really gone on. And we've, we've considered that, that this tremendously rich heritage of mythology and things that have come down to us is just the, the pre-scientific liter. Oh, they were, they were so ancient people were so fearful that they made up of, of the unknown that they made up these stories. And that has been kind of the academic perspective on this. No, these stories that have come down to us are scientific ways of propagating and perpetuating scientific information of mm -hmm. that. I'm absolutely convinced. And we can unpack that. And it's going to be a, it's a long conversation. It's really just getting underway. But mm -hmm. I think it's going to contribute massively to changing the direction of our own history. If we can get this information out in time before we, you know, right now there's this kind of dominant zero sum mentality that if we yeah. don't, if we don't fight for the diminishing resources, um, you know, we're going to lose out. We got to get these resources before the Russians, before the Chinese or whatever it may be. But when in fact, 
It's exactly the opposite. With just a flip of the switch or a shift in our perspective, we'll realize that we suddenly have at our fingertips these this tremendous, almost infinite resources and infinite energy sources. <clears throat> and it'll change the entire paradigm of modern history. If if this if this insight and this knowledge can can get out in time and is not suppressed. And can you imagine what happens when other brilliant minds can get involved then? And then we use we use our intelligence to propel it. Look what we've done in the last 50 years. Yeah. See, you make a very good point there, because if you think about the Industrial Revolution, you think about the scientific enlightenment, let's say go back to the days of Kepler and Newton and and, and Galileo and all those guys, right? To now. We're like three to four hundred years. Now imagine, look where we've come from basically feudalism to the space age, the age of that you're sitting in where you are, I'm sitting where I am. We're talking to each other. Like yeah. I couldn't have even imagined this. I'm old enough to remember when my dad brought home our first ever television set. I remember the unboxing, how exciting it was to unbox a television, right? Yeah. Um, there was no, mm. had no presence in space, no computers. When my grandparents were born, the primary mode of transportation was horseback and foot. So, I mean, think about how far we've come in just a few exactly. generations. And that now, was without connection. Now everything's connected and it's the, accelerating the hell out of everything. It certainly is. Now imagine this, Danica. What we've done in the last three or four centuries Imagine now you've got 200,000 years. Now, are we going to assume that all of those time, that all that vast span of time, humans with essentially the same size brains as we've got now, this presumably the same intelligence, didn't come up with anything that we would now construe as civilization? And, and how easily could a 1,000 years or 10,000 years oh be God. lost? And... That's maybe we should be our segue into looking at some photos here for a second before we run out of time. Yes, sir. A large boulder with a yep. man walking on top of it. Yep. Okay. That man there, that's Graham. That's Graham oh. Hancock. Cool. And what this is, <clears throat> this is an erratic boulder. It's basalt. And it was probably transported somewhere between 50 and 100 miles from its source. It's sitting on a ridge 400 feet above the modern Columbia River. And how the hell did it get there? Oh, my God. And how do you know it was transported versus there? Because we know where it came from. Oh. Because it's, it's, an, it's an identifiable type of rock. Look at this. Here's another very large boulder sitting on a hillside. Over here, you see there's another one. And yeah. it's about the same size. If I had the rest of the picture, oh, you'd wow. see that the top of these hills are mantled with these gigantic boulders. <clears throat> okay, let's let's see if we can get it. And it's basalt, you said? This is basalt, which is... What is the energy? Is there a certain co conductivity of basalt, or what is the... Well, it can have... Like a a special of, some basalt has a lot of iron in it, so I suppose it could be conductive. Mm -hmm. Basalt is, is, is formed from lava. Uh, so you have a volcanic eruption, and in fact... The, or, the ultimate origin of this basalt here that came out as lava was a mantle plume that's now under Yellowstone National Park. Wow. Which began erupting around 16 million years ago. This was actually transported around 12 or 13,000 years ago. Let's go to the next one. It's a type of rock called metaquartzite. It's huh. a, a, it's, this is found, this is, was originally one rock. It comes from an area near Jasper National Park in Canada. This is about 18,000 tons. It was one rock that's broken into three pieces. It's been transported somewhere around 400 miles from its source hmm. in Mount, Mount Edith Cavell. Okay. Now, here's the interesting thing about this. This rock, this erratic rock, is sitting on the... Uh, uh, Rocky Mountain Front in Alberta on mm -hmm. the prairie. Its origin in Mount Edith Cavell is on the other side of the Continental Divide. 
which <laughs> raises a really interesting question. How do you quarry, dislodge an 18,000 ton rock, transport it over the Continental Divide and drop it 400 miles from its source out on the prairie? But this was this was a geologist back in the 1800s who was seeing some of these erratic boulders and surmised that the only way you could explain them was iceberg transport. Icebergs, you see right here, this boulder sitting on an iceberg and the iceberg being carried in these this tremendous flow of water. Well, this amazingly is a very accurate depiction of what actually happened. These so now this is southern Idaho, right? What this tells you, Danica, is that this was water on a mega scale. That's because you don't have any rivers on earth today transporting sediment like this. Large swaths of planet earth have been dramatically shaped by mega scale flows of water. Yes. No, this isn't river shit we're talking about. This is like, uh, you know, glacial. But there was no glaciers here. So this, these were not glacially transported. They were, they were flood transported. You can see, and, and when you look at boulders, the rounding of the boulders will tell you that these were transported by water. Right. Now, Are we thinking I, this was when the, the Younger Dryas warming occurred? Could be. Could be. Um, there are a variety of dates on this, but they all place it within the same window, which is mm -hmm. right at the end of the last ice age. And those That's mountains nice. in the background that you can see really look like what happens when when the tide when the tide goes back down, and you see these little quick ridges um, that drain off. What you're looking at here is that I'm standing at the bottom of a channel 400 feet deep, and the water that came through here cut the channel. So yep. <clears throat> prior to this flood, yep. these cliffs weren't here. Right. I would have been right. 400 feet under the bedrock. Right. The water came through, it cut this channel, and in cutting the channel, it picked up the 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 rock and, and broke it up. But the rock that it was carrying, this boulder bar that I'm standing on, is hundreds of feet thick and three miles long. So there's, there's millions of these boulders that are of this tremendous size. Mm -hmm. And yeah. again, since this happened... There has been no flow. This is actually near the Snake River, southern Idaho. Nothing in the Snake River has even come remotely close to this current flow here. So this deposit is like a fossil. It was created in a single event, and it's been sitting there for twelve to 14,000 years, somewhere in that range, with little to no modification at all. But what you're seeing here is this is Horseshoe Falls, the Canadian Falls, juxtaposed upon a cataract from an ancient waterfall, wow. and they're at the same scale. Wow. And you're seeing the remnants of a horseshoe cataract here that's two and a half times the height of Niagara and five times, I'm sorry, 10 times as wide. It's five miles wide. The next one is an aerial photograph that will show you by scale. This is a cataract, it's called. Wow, so that would have been a waterfall. That, you got it. This was a waterfall, a gigantic waterfall. That created the, that. That hole. created this. And again, this is a fossil feature here. And you can oh. see it. the erosion of this goes way over to the yeah. limit. The water here that created this is flowing towards us, mm -hmm. right? And <clears throat> so this was an aerial photograph I took God, 25 years ago, maybe now, but when I was really first studying this stuff in earnest. And so I've put Horseshoe Falls up here in the corner at the same scale so that you can see that, that Niagara Falls would be utterly dwarfed by this ancient falls. This was not even the biggest one, but this the, the, the peak discharge that created this was about 350 million cubic feet per second. How do you put that into perspective? Is you yeah. take every take every river from every continent on Earth. Think of every big river you can, every medium, every little river, all of them: the Amazon, the Nile, the Columbia, the Mississippi, the Missouri, the Po, the Yellow River in China, the Orinoco, the Congo. All of them 
together wouldn't be one tenth of the flow that created this. Holy shit. So now ask yourself, um, an event like this, what's it going to leave in its aftermath? You no, got to look this is, rocks. this is 400 feet of bedrock that was catastrophically just ripped out by the water flow. The water flow through here, and you, <clears throat> you can actually tell because if you go off this channel, you can find the high water mark. The water here was 400 feet deep. So the water was as deep as this cliff is high. And at the peak of the flood, all you would have seen is a bump. And in this water, raging, turbulent water would have been thousands of icebergs because this is the catastrophic melting of the great ice sheets over Canada to the north. That's what we're seeing here. These are potholes mm -hmm. that are drilled into bedrock. Now, this is right in my backyard. This is North Carolina. But what this shows you is that, first of all, you ask the question, how, what forces turbulent flows of water can drill holes in bedrock like this and look here up here you see the yeah. the modern creek had nothing to do with the creation of this pothole mm -hmm. this pothole was created by rapidly very deep rapidly moving water um, that was so turbulent that once you have turbulence you have this property of water when it gets turbulent enough it almost wants to self-organize just like the weather does when it when you have two like a cold front and a warm front clashing and you get tornadoes it's the same phenomenon and what you have to actually picture here is that you've got very deep swiftly moving water and you're at literally looking like at an underwater tornado now i'm here i'm looking into a pothole here that's 70 feet deep can you imagine the flow of water? Now, again, this is up along the St. Croix Wild and Scenic River that forms the border between Wisconsin and northern Minnesota. This was produced by catastrophic melting of the ice sheets to the north. Um, I got another picture here taken from in the bottom of another pothole. That's our good friend Graham Hancock there. I... I Spent a couple of weeks with him, guiding him through some of these uh, areas of catastrophe so he could see firsthand while he was writing Magicians of the Gods. This The, the last thing we did at the end of our, our journey from Portland to the Twin Cities uh, was we visited these giant potholes so that he could get see for himself the power of these floods that could drill, in some cases, some of these giant potholes are 20 feet wide and 80 feet deep. Now, this was, I took this in the aftermath of Hurricane Ivan, which came through Georgia. When was it? 2009, I believe. And what happens, this is called, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at the, the caption, imbrication. Now, imagine that you have a bookshelf, Danica, and you push you, you have a stack of books and you push from one direction and all of the books lean over. Yeah. Stack, yeah. Stack like this. Well, yeah. water will move rocks and then it will deposit those rocks in a very similar manner. You okay. can see up here, I've got the current flow, the direction, the rocks will be tilted in the direction of the current flow. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. Mm -hmm. Doesn't it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, here's another example. And once mm -hmm. you've seen it, it's very clear. And I mm -hmm. put a little walkie-talkie in there for for scale, right? And you can see the imbricate rocks. Yep. Now, this yeah. was this was a hundred-year flood. Wow. Huh. Hurricane Ivan. It came through here because this is like twenty feet, twenty-five feet above the modern creek. Look at the size of these. This is imbric sure. imbrication. Uh huh. And your current flow is. Is like it's, you see the arrow here from right to left. Right, which should kind of give you a multiple in scale. You could probably do some math on that of the oh yeah weight of that okay. rock versus those boulders are monsters, and you got to begin to think about what kind of water flow would move boulders and stack boulders like that. Well, so what I've been doing, and the thing is, it's not just an ocean or like it's flow. Yeah, it's flowing. It's moving it. Like, it's, this yeah. is just like, this is raging. It's raging. And it's probably hundreds of feet deep. 
And, and nothing subsequent to the event that put these rocks here has had anywhere even remotely close to the ability to alter the effects of that one event. One of the great um, uh, paleohydrologists of our modern time, uh, Victor Baker, who's done a lot of work, has in a paper that he's got that I like to quote, he's, has, he realized, and he, it's an actual quote from one of his peer-reviewed scientific papers, that one of the primary geomorphic um, shaping events on the planet on earth has been plant. He, this is his term planetary scale movement of water. Absolutely. So when you're talking about planetary scale movement of water, I can tell you this, Danica, if these kinds of events, the younger driest type events and these flooding type events were to happen today, 10,000 years from now, archeologists would be having a hard time finding evidence that we were here. Right now yeah. this, you can look here, modern snake river, average annual discharge, Let's just call it 57,000 cubic feet per second. That's this river down here, which mm -hmm. is a pretty vigorous river. If you go rafting or canoeing on this, it's a pretty vigorous river. The Bonneville flood was up to 40, 40 million cubic feet per second. And that's what created this channel. So the entire Snake River, the largest 100-year floods, might come up and submerge the floodplain. But there has been no flood since this Bonneville flood that has ever been able to rise up over the rim and flood the surrounding areas. The modern Snake River, even in its largest flood capacity, is completely trapped within this ancient channel. And let me tell you that virtually every river in North America is flowing in an ancient channel that's completely oversized relative to the modern river that's flowing in it. Once you begin to understand the magnitude of this planetary scale remodeling, now you can really go, okay, maybe there was a lot more going on in prehistoric times than we have been willing to admit. Well, the man, the, the most dangerous thing to the powers to be that, you know, make all the money and control the elements, the commodities of the world is that we all understand that there are far better ways, far more efficient ways, far more technology that's available that we don't have to live in this fashion. We can evolve. I would think the core of why people would suppress it is because it there are people making money off of the archaic ways that we're going about using commodities and yep. oil and different things to you know continue our life uh, that they don't want to lose. Some people, will lose. Go broke. some people will lose money and some people will make money. Well, and it, the people that have it don't want to let go of it. Yeah, and that's always the way it is with progress. So I'm curious as a as a last question of what your goal is with all of this work. Well, my goal is to get this information out because I think that, for one thing, I don't think we can have a realistic strategy for our future on this planet without understanding the past. <laughs> that's one thing. And I mentioned earlier this, the kind of the zero sum mindset that, you know, which is basically, you know, the Malthusian view that resources are finite. And if one side gets access to resources, the other side mm -hmm. won't. And mm -hmm. I think that's a completely obsolete view of the world. And I believe that there are technologies uh, waiting in the wings that completely will change the whole paradigm of how we consume energy on this planet. Mm -hmm. Also, the realization that, look, we are vulnerable and we need to work together internationally. See, this was to me like a wake-up call. Tunguska was a wake-up call of 1908. It showed us what can happen. And there is evidence in hand now, and this can be another discussion we have, but that evidence like what happened at the Younger Dryas was probably not a big single impact like what knocked out the dinosaurs, was probably a multiple impact event that involved hundreds, if not thousands, of Tunguska-like objects. Right. Almost like having a nuclear war without the radiation. <laughs> but if you imagine unleashing 6,000 nuclear weapons on half the planetary surface, I think that's kind of what we're looking at as far as the Younger Dryas. 
that influences the elements instead of sort of some sort of toxic nuclear fallout. It's the elements. We're talking about water, yeah. ice, ice, fire. Fire, ice. There's an old English saying, water and fire have no mercy. Fire and water have no mercy. And there's a lot of interesting old traditions about that. You know, I mean, the, the Mayans believe destruction of the world by fire, alternating with destruction of the world by water. The Greeks had the same tradition about alternate catastrophes, the Hopi Indians. Um, and I've had the privilege lately of of being able to sit directly and learn some of the, the, the traditions from the storytellers, both of the Zuni and the Hopi. And interestingly, what's going on, and, and I'll make this very quick, is that a lot of the, with with the modern era, a lot of the young people growing up in the tribes have lost interest in the ancient stories and are more interested in the the internet and the you know whatever all the stuff the distractions of the, the world dis, the distractions of the world exactly, and so now some of these tribes that have held these traditions very close are becoming much more liberal about sharing their traditions yeah so, somebody's got to somebody has to carry the stories that's right that's right and i've had the opportunity of being out in the deserts with some of these not far from where you are yeah it's not it's the hopi the hopi, re, hopi yeah. area is not very far it's just further a little bit north and being you know fairly well inversed in the science of paleohydrology which is the science of these ancient great flood flows the consistency between my understanding from science and what's being related in these stories to me is remarkable, which just tells me, yes, these are real authentic traditions and we can learn a lot from them. So that's another kind of well, dimension of this whole thing. You're here to usher in the next era, you know, to, to be a truth teller. To I hope expose, so. Yeah, yeah. It always takes brave people, smart, motivated, and curious people. And um, to, to, to bring in something new. And, you know, I'm sure there've been a few points in time where maybe people have thought you've been off your rails, but it's happened. Yeah. Some of the most brilliant were uh, the, the most brilliant people in history. What one of them has been someone that's considered super rational and has their shit together and everything they're saying is completely, you know, uh, believable, like no yeah. one, no one, no one that, no one that brings in great new knowledge is really has a has has gone through time being excluded from that club of being a little crazy so let's bring it on good i like that let's bring it on i think <laughs> I, I think we're due for some really exciting things in the next few years i love it yeah, i love it too. well thank you so much Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.